Hello, and welcome to Book Dreams, the podcast for everyone who loves books and has ever wondered about them. I'm Julie Sternberg, author of a number of children's books, including Like Pickle Juice on a Cookie and its sequels, and the Top Secret Diary of Celie Valentine series. And I'm Eve Johallam. I'm also a children's book author. My books include The Truth According to Blue and Cast Off, The Strange Adventures of Petra de Winter and Brom Broen. In each episode of this podcast, we consider a book-related question. And in this episode, we consider what are the books that have shaped some of the most famous writers who are writing today? What are the books they read as kids? And which books help make them the writers that they are? There's a phenomenal new book that just came out. It's as if the author sat down and said, what would Julie Sternberg like to read? (laughs) And then they put it together. It's called The Writer's Library. The two writers who came up with it are Nancy Pearl and Jeff Schwager. We'll tell you more about them in a second. They traveled to authors' homes and they interviewed them about the books that they loved the most. We're talking about authors like Donna Tartt, Luis Alberto Urea. Andrew Sean Greer, Madeline Miller, Leila Lalami, Louise Erdrich, Jonathan Lethem, the list goes on and on. Can you imagine getting to go to all of these authors' homes and sit down with them? This was obviously pre-COVID. I, I, I can only fantasize, but what I can imagine because we got to do it was we got to talk to Nancy and Jeff about what it was like for them to sit down with all of these authors. So that was... I won't say almost as good, but pretty darn good. It was fantastic. It was so fun in a time when, I don't know about you, but I'm not having a lot of fun. It was a reminder, too, of the joy that books can bring, not just reading them, but sometimes even more so talking about them and sharing the delight of a favorite read. Mm Mm-hmm. A word of advice to everyone listening, you may want to listen to this episode with a pen in your hand because there are so many book recommendations. But at the same time, don't worry if you miss a few because we're going to list all the books that we talk about in the show notes. Let's tell you a little bit about the two remarkable people who put this book together. Best-selling author, librarian, literary critic, and devoted reader Nancy Pearl can be heard on NPR's Morning Edition discussing her favorite books, and her monthly television show, Book Lust with Nancy Pearl, features interviews with authors, poets, and other literary figures. Among her many honors are the 2011 Librarian of the Year Award from Library Journal. Nancy is the creator of the internationally recognized program, If All of Seattle Read the Same Book, and as far as we know, she's the only librarian to have inspired an action figure. And Jeff Schwager is a Seattle-based writer, editor, producer, playwright, and entertainment and media executive. He's written extensively on books, movies, music, and theater. Book It Repertory Theater produced his acclaimed adaptation of Dennis Johnson's Jesus's Son and his award-winning dramatization of Michael Chabon's The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. So we started by asking Nancy, who's a former children's librarian, if she thought our favorite childhood books can have more of an impact on us than books we read as an adult. Here's what she said. That certainly comes through in the interviews. The books that I read when I was like 10 and 11, we used to call them like soda shop novels um, for Bobby Sox novels, I guess. Those really gave me this weird view of what adulthood, what a life should be like. Looking back, that was not particularly helpful to me. Right. You know, I wanted a white picket fence and I wanted all of those things that those characters presumably would have had as adults based on their own adolescence. So I think they stay with us in these weird, weird ways, but often we're not lucky enough to remember the titles or the books. I mean, we just took stuff from those books. Do any of the writers' childhood stories stand out for you in your memory? Well, for me, Jonathan Lethem uh, talking about reading House of the Dead at uh, age 11 (laughs) really stood out. Um, (laughs) Just such a quintessentially Jonathan Lethem thing to have done. Some of the other writers talk about books that Precociously, they read like Louise Erdrich reading Marjorie Morningstar when she was a kid. But there's something about the morbidity of reading a book called House of the Dead when you're 11 years old that is just odd and funny and seems to inform so much of Jonathan's work. That really stood out for me. I don't know. What about you, Nancy? Nancy? 
Oh, I think Luis Surea's story of being torn between his Mexican father's desire that he be Mexican and his American mother's desire that he be American played out in the books that they gave him to read. I found that very, very interesting. And then Leila Lalami's stories of growing up in Morocco and what that meant in terms of identifying as a Moroccan as opposed to to being one of the French part of the colonial empire. I found that very, very, very interesting and just something to think about. This was such a little thing, but I love what Maza Mengiste says about the first book that she remembers reading in Kenya was that it was that it was Jack and Jill and that she got the book and she was like, this is fascinating. Here are these two kids going down this hill. <laughs> right. and it was just, I assume she wasn't joking. And it just feels like a born writer to me. Like everything is fascinating. Right. And I loved it when Louise Erdrich read George Orwell's Animal Farm. She said she read it at age eight and said, this is the best book about pigs ever. Right. You know? (laughs) Yes. That was such a great moment. It struck me that many, actually maybe even most of the writers you interviewed mentioned their mothers and how following their mother's examples or reading their mother's collections of books is what made them readers. Is there anything to that observation? Well, it may be a generational thing. Many of the writers came of age at a time when fathers were the primary workers in in the house and mothers were at home and reading to them more. We talked to Michael Shabin and and Ayala Waldman, and one of the things that they talked about was how Michael read to their kids up until the time that they were almost in their early teens. He would read to them every night. I suspect that his children will look back and think that He was the person who influenced them. I think the person who reads to you is so important. Certainly, Luis Urea's mother reading Tom Sawyer to him was was Mm -hmm. such a a huge (laughs) and important (laughs) place. Yeah, that was, oh, God. that was so great. I have to say, I think maybe if people read only one essay from this whole book, maybe that one should be the one. I mean, that was such a wonderful, just array of stories and insights. Right. And of, of course, Luis ends with his fascination with Bigfoot. Which he said was real. He wasn't being funny. No, uh-uh. And then the other part of that interview, which I just love, is how important Ursula Le Guin was to him. She called him Luisito. Luisito, you must not. He must not have any women look in mirrors and talk about how fabulous their breasts <laughs> look right. in his books. Yeah. <laughs> she made a feminist of him, or at least, you know, brought him along. Yes. I love that. That's a wonderful interview. You are so right. If there's one essay you're going to read in the book, this really may be be it. (laughs) And for listeners who don't know Luis Urea, he's the author of a lot of award-winning books, fiction and nonfiction. I think his most recent book is The House of Broken Angels. Let me just read aloud the part of the book where he talks about his affection for Tom Sawyer or for the book Tom Sawyer. So in the essay, Luis Araya is talking about how his mother used to read aloud to him, and she's just switched from reading a lot of Dickens to him to reading Mark Twain. And he says, and that was it, man. It was Tom Sawyer. And I was just astonished. Growing up in San Diego and Tijuana, we didn't have big rivers, so I didn't know what the Mississippi was, but it all seemed fabulous. This old man, this dead American, who'd probably in my mind been dead maybe a thousand years, I don't know, had written this thing that was so graspable and contemporary and funny that it was as though he was right there with us. I'll confess it to you, because now we can put it on the record, that my first erotic realization in life was Becky Thatcher. And Nancy <laughs> says, Tom's friend Becky? <laughs> And Luis Urea says, I was hot for Becky Thatcher, man. (laughs) (laughs) And there's that scene when Tom Sawyer chews her piece of gum that she'd been chewing. I lost my mind. I remember (laughs) lying there and I thought, what? He's got her gum in his mouth. First of all, I didn't know you could do that. And I never even thought something like that could be in a book. I remember saying something to my mom like, um... I was distracted, Mom. Could you read that again? I was like, whoa. (laughs) So I really wanted to be Becky Thatcher's boyfriend really, really badly. (laughs) I was just, I was howling. (laughs) 
<laughs> so fabulous. I know. I loved reading that essay so much. And I also loved reading, um, there's this moment in Louise Erdrich's essay where she says that her family didn't have many books. She grew up in a small town in North Dakota. And one of the very few books they had was Marjorie Morningstar by Herman yes. Woke. And she, <laughs> she says that she saved Herman Woke's obituary because she thought, you started me, Herman. You started me <laughs> off as a writer. I love it. And I love that so much because, you know, she grew up in North Dakota. She's a member of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa. Her maternal grandfather was a tribal chairman. And, you know, I grew up in Baton Rouge in a Jewish family. And I loved Marjorie Morningstar. Mm. So the thought of her curled up at home, held wrapped by Marjorie Morningstar, in my mind, that's happening at the same moment that I'm on the floor of my bedroom in Baton Rouge, like hiding between my bed and my wall, not wanting my mother to call me to dinner. I didn't want her to find me. I just wanted to <laughs> stay there and finish Marjorie Morningstar. Oh. I love that the same book can bring you together, like in from really from very different worlds. Totally. And that reminds me of something else she said, which was, I can slip in and out of nonfiction, but if I don't have a novel, I feel lost. And yeah, I totally I get exactly. that. I, you know, I'll notice sometimes that I'm just, just sort of feeling on edge and cranky. And then I'll realize, oh, I haven't read a novel in a few days. <laughs> I'm just not myself. So getting back to our interview with Nancy and Jeff, the next thing we asked them about was whether they found that any of the books that writers mentioned were particularly surprising to them, or conversely, whether they were surprised at how rarely certain books came up. And here's what they said. Well, I was shocked by how many of the writers talked about how important Watership Down was in their reading life. And I was fascinated when Madeline Miller talked about how it, she saw that book as a heroic tale and how the last hundred pages, you know, she could barely breathe because she didn't know whether they would succeed, which is exactly how you feel when you're reading The Lord of the Rings or Odysseus. Is Odysseus going to get home? And I remember in the interview, and I think this is in the book, where I said, I see a copy of Watership Down on your shelf there. And she said, oh, that's not my real copy. <laughs> she said, my comfort copy is upstairs right. in my bedroom. <laughs> yes. You asked if we were surprised at people who weren't mentioned. One writer who, I don't know if he comes up at all in the book, is Hemingway. Yeah. None of the writers really seem to be influenced by Hemingway. On the other hand, Fitzgerald comes up quite frequently. One wonders what Hemingway's place in the, in the canon will be in 100 years. There was someone who said you can't ignore the importance of the change that Hemingway made to style, but the content is so adolescent, which I thought was a great way of describing. Yeah, that was Charles Johnson said that. Charles said it in response to a question that I asked about the sort of three major uh, American writers of that era, Faulkner, Fitzgerald, and Hemingway. So he was responding to what I said, but I don't think anybody brought up Hemingway on their own. And nobody mentioned Bernard Malamud at all. A big disappointment to me. I, Malamud's short stories were so influential to me as a young reader, just shaping my worldview. And my mother was also came over after uh, World War II. She died when I was very young. And those stories seemed to tell me something about the world that my mother came into that meant a lot to me. And yet nobody really seemed to think of them as formative stories. If you were to go again in 20 years, do you have any guesses about which books would be the most commonly named as formative? Yeah, Cloud Atlas, would I bet be one? Mm -hmm. I have to think The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, um, Circe, by Madeline Miller, I think is going to end up being a book that lasts a long time. And Madeline is currently working on a retelling of The Tempest. And I'm just dying to see what she does with that. I wouldn't be surprised if that book, when it comes out, is, is something that really influences people. Have either of you noticed a changing role for books during the pandemic? <laughs> 
I've been doing a lot of library appearances recently, and it seems to me that people are not interested in heavy books. What people want to read is something that will take them away from where they are. They don't want sadness. I mean, I'm overgeneralizing, of course, but I can say from my own reading, I feel that way. I haven't read so much science fiction and fantasy as I've read in the last six months, in the last six years. I was talking to somebody about this, saying that a lot of the books I've been reading recently also have been books from this publisher called Dean Street Press. They reprint books that were published from the 1920s to the 1960s mainly. And there's a section in their publishing that they call the furrowed middle brow press. (laughs) I get, we get it. Yeah, (laughs) we totally get it. Right, exactly. (laughs) Most of them are set, you know, in the period between World War I through the end of World War II. And they're British, especially World War II was very difficult in Britain. Yet it's easier to read about that because it's done. Another time, another place. Yeah, exactly. And we know how it ends. And we know how it ends. And that's, to me, the scariest thing about where we are is that we don't know how this is going to end. That's why when I read a book... I'm really tempted and I frequently give in to turning to the last page. I want to know how that book ends before I'm going to commit to reading it. The book that I've been recommending most often to people is A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Tolls. First, because it's a book that teaches you how to live in isolation. It's about a man who's forced to live in a hotel for the rest of his life. And if he steps outside, he'll be executed but also because it's a a wonderful, charming version of that experience, a much more charming version of it than what we're all living through. I'm curious, right now, today, what are the books at the forefront of your minds? Of all the books you've encountered, what's resonating with you right now? Lonesome Dove is a book that Nancy and I both really love, and it's a book that is In its way, an ideal book for this time because it takes you so far away from this time to a world that's really nothing like what we're living right now, where we're all kind of stuck in our homes between four walls. And Lonesome Dove is a book that takes place out in the open. The dangers that they face are so different than the dangers that we're facing right now. You know, we're dreading germs that we can't see and and they're dreading... uh, Rattlesnakes. Yeah. And it's a wonderfully written book. And it's a, it's a long book that just moves at a breakneck pace. Because I walk every day, I mostly listen to audio books with occasional football podcasts <laughs> in between. <laughs> there are two different audio book versions, two different readers of Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnhem. And I listened to one, the one by Nadia May, and it is so wonderful. Here in Seattle, it's October and it's gray and it's going to be raining. And here are these four women who go off to Italy for the month of April. And it's so nicely written. And there are these just great sentences. So I listened to the whole audio book read by Nadia May. And then I immediately started the other version of it. Immediately. They were both on my phone and I just started the the other one. And then last night I watched the movie. It's resonating with you. Yeah. (laughs) In some way. Yeah. They're all sort of stuck in an existence that they don't enjoy and they get themselves out of it through a very quiet time. I could see that. I love that book. Oh, you do? Oh, Oh, I love it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I've been tweeting every night a backlist book of the day because I really feel like we pay too much attention to new books and why not try to bring people to read things like the summer book or whatever. People are really appreciating that sort of idea of going back to older titles. When we were talking just now, my mind bounced back to a previous question. You asked about books that weren't ever brought up in the course of these interviews. And one that kind of surprises me is Infinite Jest, which is a book that I was not 
able to get through. I, I don't think I got more than 20 pages. Nancy calls me an intellectual, but uh, that book had my head spinning. I just couldn't I made it to about it. 200, but I didn't finish the whole thing. Wow. I was too intimidated to even open it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I kind of liked it. I remember. So you read the whole thing? I think I did. Yeah. Now who's the intellectual? (laughs) Right, right. I so wanted to like Infinite Jest because I want to think of myself as an intellectual. And it also it involves tennis. And I'm a big tennis player. I just find his sentences to be too daunting. I have to read them three times. It reminds me of trying to read Ulysses or uh, Thomas Pynchon's early books. Yeah, you read them three times and then you take a nice rest. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> um, we, we, we wanted to ask you some of the questions that you asked authors to sort of turn the tables a bit. I want to start by asking if you came from a reading household and what your favorite books were as a child. My parents were both readers, although my father never went beyond the eighth grade and didn't get his GED until he was in his 70s. He was very proud of that. My mother was a huge um, science fiction and fantasy fan. It wasn't a very happy household. I spent all my time at the local library, and it was the librarians who really gave me the world by, you know, giving me all these books to read. And Many of my favorite children's books are horse and dog books. There's a horse book called, long out of print, called Tick Tock and Jim, about a boy who trades his grandfather's watch that he's been given for a horse that some traveling salesman is selling. And the teenage books by Mary Stoltz, especially, well, I loved them all, but In a Mirror I wanted to reprint that. I wish somebody would reprint that. It's so relevant today in the Me Too era and what's colleges and relationships between. And they were written in the 50s. But so many children's books are so meaningful to me. Yeah, I come from a a, a very different household than Nancy. Um, Yes, indeed. My parents were hyper educated to begin with my uh, Father has a PhD in chemistry. My mother was in the same chemistry program as my father at Berkeley and ended up ending with her master's because my brother was born and she had to drop out of the PhD program. But later, once my brother and I were both in elementary school, she became a computer programmer for IBM, Mm. an early computer programmer. So they were very educated people and um, they were readers. Um, My father read a lot of history, and my mother mostly read uh, mysteries. Children's books don't play any real role in my memories as a reader. I'm sure I read them when I was a kid, and I'm sure my parents read them to me. And I can remember seeing Dr. Seuss books around the house, but they just made no great impact on me. What did make an impact on me at an early age was Agatha Christie books, Mm -hmm. which my Mm -hmm. mother read. And I developed a very early love of mysteries. After my mother died, I read a lot of the books that she had left behind when I was a teenager. And one of those books was F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, short stories. And that book had a greater influence on me than any other book I've ever read. Just because when I read it, I sort of suddenly realized what literature was and what it could do for you. And I was a big music fan, a big Bob Dylan fan, a big Beatles fan. And uh, suddenly I could hear the music in language when I read Fitzgerald. Another book that was on my mother's shelf was a book called The Hat on the Bed by John O'Hara. Yeah. It's a book of short stories. And uh, Nancy and I, one of the authors that we've bonded over is John O'Hara, who we both love and, and who we both have the same favorite John O'Hara book, which is a collection of novellas called Sermons in Soda Water. Mm -hmm. That's the book probably that Nancy and I recommended most to the writers that we interviewed just because none of them had read it. Literally mm -hmm. not one writer had read it. It's so marvelously written, such beautiful language. It was written around 1960 and it's from the point of view of a character very much like O'Hara in 1960, looking back on his early life in the 30s and uh, just tremendously nostalgic and wonderful. Nancy, I I think Jeff answered this, but was there a book for you that made you think, you know what, 
That's it. This is how I want to spend my life. I want to devote it to books. Maybe it was the Lord of the Rings trilogy, Mm -hmm. The Mm -hmm. Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings, because then you could see what could be done. A sort of imagination plus the hard work of putting words down on paper could come up with something as remarkable as that. I'm going to ask you another one of those on-the-spot questions. <laughs> Who is your favorite living writer and why? Oh, God. I can go first because the answer is <laughs> very easy for me. It's Alice Munro. Mm. Her short stories, to me, are the most amazingly constructed short stories uh, ever written. They each, in their way, uh, pack in the kind of experience that you'd expect from a novel. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, with such an amazing compression and such a wonderful capturing of the telling details in people's lives in a way that you really feel like you've read a novel when you've read one of her stories. Most of them take place in the 50s in rural Canada, which is an experience far from my own. And yet she draws me into that world and makes that world feel like a world that I've lived in. The, the fabulous combination to me of both familiar and very strange, like very unexpected and very familiar. It's a really unusual thing about her stories. I, I love them too. Yeah, she's completely unique as a writer. And um, I think it was Susan Choi who we were talking about short stories and asked her who her favorite writer of short stories was. And she said, well, Alice Munro, I, you know, I, I don't see who compares to her other than Tolstoy and he's dead. (laughs) (laughs) How about you, Nancy? Do you have a favorite living writer? I can't answer that. I can't say there's one writer. There are certainly writers that I feel really interested in what they're going to do next, but it is easier for me to say like, you know, I loved Little Big Man. I loved, as Jeff said, Lonesome Dove. I loved the early Ann Tyler books, certainly through dinner at the homesick restaurant, maybe through the accidental tourist. Those are the books that, gosh, I was working at a bookstore in Tulsa when those were coming out. And God, we sold a lot of those books because I wouldn't (laughs) let anybody leave the store without buying one. But to say a favorite author, I know as soon as we hang up, I'm going to think of who it is. That's okay. I don't, I don't want to put pressure on you. But also our email is always open. Yes, exactly. <laughs> what are the books that you've either read or added to your to-be-read list as a result of these interviews? Well, for me right now, uh, David Mitchell is somebody I had not read going into working on this book. Uh, he's someone who I was intimidated by. I'd read a lot about Cloud Atlas mm-hmm. and... Um, It looked daunting. It was always on my to-be-read list, uh, but I hadn't read it. So many people mentioned David Mitchell as an influence, and Michael Chabon, a question we asked uh, him and his wife, Ayelet Waldman, was, is there a book out there that you wish you had written? And her answer was The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, (laughs) but his answer was Cloud Atlas. After our interviews with Viet Thanh Nguyen and Leila Lalami, I went to get a copy of Edward Said's Orientalism Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I hadn't read it um, when it first came out. But the way that they talked about it, it felt like it was a really important book for me to read Mm -hmm. um, as well. So that was one of the books. And then the other was Richard Adams' Watership Down. Mm -hmm. I feel like... I need to go back and see what all these people saw in it. Another one that uh, has moved to the top of my to-be-read list is uh, Bob Shikosius's The Woman Who Lost Her Soul, because several writers had it on their shelves, and Nancy loves it so much and has made me promise to read it. That's a book that uh, I'm definitely planning to read. So... Eve, have there been any books that you've added to your to-be-read list as a result of the interviews? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> so, so, so many. I mean, off the top of my head, I've never read Orientalism, the Edward Said book, mm-hmm. and I've always meant to. I'm now dying to read Watership Down because I think 
maybe it's an exaggeration to say almost every writer mentioned it, but a lot of the writers it was mentioned weird. it. Yeah. So I really want to. And then Middlemarch, because at this point, you, Jim Mustick, and half the authors in this book have mentioned it as formative. And I cannot believe that I've never read it, but I've never read it. Oh, I'm so jealous that you get to read it for the first time. It's your all-time favorite book, isn't it? I love that book. I do. Yeah. You have to be patient with it. You have to get into the language and the mood of it, but it's so good. I will keep that in mind for sure. And what about you? I know you must have dozens. Oh, <laughs> wait, or, um, <laughs> wait, knowing you, you've already bought dozens. <laughs> Uh, many of them, many of them. It's, some of them have already arrived. Oh, which ones? <laughs> What's on the pile? I know. So just some of the books that I want to read. Um, I want to reread Marjorie Morningstar. Mm-hmm. I want to read Nancy's novel. Nancy wrote a novel called George and Lizzie. I'd like to read that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And then after hearing that she used to push Ann Tyler's early novels into the hands of everyone who walked into the bookstore where she was working. I've ordered one of Ann Tyler's early books called The Clockwinder. Mm -hmm. I want to read Luis Urea's The House of Broken Angels. I want to read The Shadow King by Maza Mengiste. And I'm actually starting now Little Big Man by Thomas Berger, which both Nancy and Jeff mentioned as a book they love. Well, we're definitely going to read a bunch of books from this book, and we'll talk about it in a future episode. And if any of you decide to read some books from the Writer's Library, please let us know. We can talk about those too. Yes, I would love that. So I think that's it for this episode of the Book Dreams podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like the podcast and think someone else would too, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. Be sure to let us know if there's a book-related topic you've wondered about, and we'll try looking into it in a future episode. You can reach us for that reason or any other at contact at bookdreamspodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at bookdreamspod and on Instagram at bookdreamspodcast. You can find Nancy on Twitter at Nancy underscore Pearl and also at NancyPearl.com. And Jeff is at Jeff Schwager 10 on Twitter. Many thanks to our associate producer, Gianfranco Lentini, and to our theme music composer, Maya Polsky. You can find Eve at eviohallam.com and me at juliesternberg.com. And check out the podcast website, www.bookdreamspodcast.com. Until next time, happy book dreaming. Happy book dreaming. Love. To book dreams with Julie and me.